careful land use and development guidelines have produced what amounts to a new approach to the structure of the urban block, namely a module comprised of a residential and street-oriented retail. The implementation of this module has enabled the city to increase both in density and in scale without compromising the integrity of the street as the primary urban space. And in so doing, Vancouver has become the poster child for urban transformation and intensification. Mr. Beasley now teaches and advises the private sector and governments around the world. Here in Ottawa, he chairs the National Advisory Committee on Planning, Design, and Realty for the NCC. He's also chief advisor on urban design for the city of Dallas. He sits on the International Economic Development Advisory Board for the city of Rotterdam and is the special advisor on city planning uh, to the government of Abu Dhabi. Mr. Beasley is a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Planners, an honorary member of the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects, and has been recognized as an advocate for architecture by the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. In 2007, he received the prestigious Kevin Lynch Prize from the Mass Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Mr. Beasley's CV lists no fewer than 33 major awards in the last 25 years. Keep you busy just accepting awards. Uh, of particular note is his status as a member of the Order of Canada, the nation's highest honor for lifetime achievement. Before I turn the podium over to tonight's speaker, however, I want to acknowledge the generous and long-standing support of the sponsors of this series, including IBI Group, Charles Fort Developments, Merkley Supply, Barry J. Hoban and Associate Architects, Griffiths Rankin Cook, and Trinity Development Group. Um, please join me in a round of applause for these uh, sponsors that make this forum series possible. Um, I've been asked to, uh, to note that there have been uh, slight changes uh, in the dates of the remaining two forum lecture series of this year. Uh, Homa Fajadi uh, is now coming on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. Uh, and the last speaker, Craig Dykers, will be here on March uh, 23rd. Uh, there will be email announcements going out to remind you, but I thought I would just point that out. Um, I was also asked to remind any students who might have received a questionnaire uh, via email on the forum lecture series uh, that there's still time to respond and your response is very much uh, awaited. So now, without further ado, please welcome me in joining tonight's distinguished speaker, Larry Beasley. Thank you, Ben, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I live in Vancouver, and but live most of my time everywhere but Vancouver. But I think that uh, Ottawa is like my second home. I've uh, worked here to, uh, because of the wonderful sponsorship of uh, an invitation of the NCC for many, many years. And uh, like many Canadians, treasure this city uh, as so important to the country. Uh, and so to be here to talk about it uh, is very special for me. Uh, also of this, this extraordinary building, um, I was recently in, um, I think it was London or Paris, I forget which one, and there was an exhibition, uh, I, I know it was here, the exhibition of Masha Safi's work, I think was here, and it's an amazing, uh, an amazing, I think, exploration of different ways of building cities, which is really the topic that I want to talk about. I am going to be talking about the quest for a world-leading green national capital. And this phrase really comes to the fore constantly now when you are in among a group of people that are involved in capital cities or who are talking about capital cities around the world. Our mission is to be the greenest capital city in the world. And there's no question that that's a laudable phrase and it's a very laudable aspiration. But you know, the cynic in me asks if this is really just a public relations gimmick uh, that you see floating around the world uh, uh, at a civic level, but also at a national level. You know, I've actually heard it said that this is really just about the quality of our green spaces and you can imagine that the skeptic in me just pops out 
when I hear that said about this particular topic. Now, the optimist in me really does hope that this is, in fact, a serious dream and that it will be backed up by very specific policy and aggressive implementation here and elsewhere, in fact, as in every urban place in the world. The competitor uh, in me sees real and meaningful changes toward green practices happening in some of the world's capital cities, this being Stockholm, uh, and in other progressive cities in the world. And it makes me worry about what is happening in my own capital uh, here in Canada, here in Ottawa. And then the realist in me, of course, uh, uh, feels and knows that, in fact, no city in the world is carbon and waste neutral, no city in the world is truly sustainable, and that everywhere we have a long way to go to create an urban future that we can depend upon in terms of being able to carry on in some kind of amenable relationship with the natural environment. But let's, get, let's go back to the phrase, our mission is to be the greatest capital, uh, greenest capital city in the world. I personally think that this reflects a very strong anxiety that is out there among the general public, perhaps more intuitively than anything else, about the environmental degradation that is rampant almost everywhere, the climate change that people are experiencing on the ground daily these days, uh, the health challenges that people see in their own families, and the brutal impact of urban dysfunction that people have to cope with in almost every city every day. And I think it reflects a sentiment among many people that we just need to do something about this. And what I hope is a growing political pressure for government to do something about this before it's too late. The fact is that most people don't actually like the totality of urban life. They worry about what it's gonna do to their families and they try to escape it whenever they can. We know for sure that most people, especially in North America, leave the city when they form their own households and they start to have their children. And I bet there's, that's true for a lot of people in this very room tonight. And I think the statistics really tell the story. Over two thirds of Canadians have fled our cities and are now living in the suburbs. Almost all of these people, because they wanted to, not because they had to. And I suspect that overall figure for the nation is even higher here in the city of Ottawa. Now, I could continue this presentation tonight by telling you the whole grisly story of what's been happening to the environment, the, what's been called the inconvenient truth of that. But I think that everyone in this room knows the basics of this story, and I think you'd be bored to death if I just repeated what you've already heard so many times. So instead tonight, I want to be that optimist. I want to talk seriously about the urban green aspiration, the national capital green aspiration, uh, its principles and to some degree the specific aspects of it. And I, then I want to outline what I think our capital region in Ottawa, Gatineau, with the NCC and the federal government needs to be doing about this. Uh, what this one capital could do and why it could be green, why it's such a, a good capital to move forward in a green direction. And I want to reinforce, tell you about some very creative thinking that is in fact going on here in the capital to start to move the region in that direction. And I hope you already see that um, I'm using these images this uh, PowerPoint has kind of a life of its own, uh, frankly, and uh, hopefully even as I talk, it'll, it'll lighten up the occasion, as I felt lightened up when I drove by this building uh, in Rotterdam a few months ago. Now, to start, let me declare my ground. Let me tell you what I think going green really means. And to do that, I want to simply remind you of that short and very elegant, clear formula for smart growth that many of us already know about. And here is that formula 
in a nutshell. It covers both the structure and the infrastructure of cities. From a structural point of view, it's about the form of our cities, clustered density and mixed use and uh, all kinds of diversity uh, and protected uh, open space, natural and more urbanized, all focused on a simple proposition of proximity because it is proximity, getting everything closer together and more interconnected that solves many of the environmental issues that cities are facing. It's also about the fabric of our cities, uh, environmentally neutral construction of buildings and spaces, and it's about, of course, the character of our cities, placemaking and quality and local, localized uh, uniqueness. And second, from an infrastructure point of view, it's about the circulation within our cities, more and more transportation choices, less and less dependence on the conventional private car. And obviously, and in a very big way, it's about the utilities within our cities, managing water and waste and energy in a conserving way, and where possible, accessing local inputs and local food. Now, there is not just one urban model that represents this formula. In fact, there are endless models, and there needs to be endless models to reflect the richness of circumstances and choices that people want and that people will need in the cities of the future. Every city has to find its own way to achieve uh, the formula. And even within said cities, different areas will have to have different answers, all of which will make sense and contribute, hopefully, to a green direction. And I'll come back to this aspect in a moment. But what also fascinates me even more is that the formula of smart growth is a formula that we now know works very well over a range of challenges that we face in modern life. Now, you know the environmental side of the story. The many testimonials are out there in terms of how it helps us to deal with environmental problems. That's how the idea originated. But from the work of Jane Jacobs and Richard Florida, we also know that this formula works in terms of economic opportunity and robustness. Uh, we know, for ex particularly because of the aspect of diversity. From Dr. Larry Frank at the University of British Columbia, uh, we know from his extensive research that this is the right formula also to address our most endemic health problems, especially those focused on the growing obesity in the country. And I think, frankly, the same can be said for culture and for quality of life, and perhaps even for national ingenuity, although I may be pushing beyond science to speculation when I say that. But what really interests me is that all of these issues come into focus under the same urban lens. Now, in my opinion, Ottawa could be a real leader in this area because it has already, looking at it in, in, in the context of world cities, many things working in its favor. It remains a very manageably sized city. Uh, we're finding, for example, there's a lot of evidence that mid-sized cities are easier to govern, they're easier to operate. It has a, a history of relatively good local government and quite forward-looking planning along with the attentions and investments of an overarching national agency that's still local focused, that's now been in place for almost, a, in one guise or another, of almost 100 years. And over the past several years, we have seen the start of an extraordinary process of analysis and planning and public discussion to look at a specific sustainable scenario over the next 100 years. And many of you know uh, what I'm talking about. And frankly, if you don't, uh, you should get connected to this discussion because uh, if you care about Ottawa, what comes out of it is very important. Of course, I'm talking about the Choosing Our Future study that's underway with a stated goal of, as they put it themselves, integrating concepts of sustainability, resiliency, and livability into all facets of planning, design, and governance for the region by reevaluating, this really is where it gets gutsy, institutional structures, mindsets, and policies. And I think that's a very audacious quest 
but I think it will provide a clear framework for the future that is sorely missing in this region uh, and that will be very different from the status quo trends that are currently shaping the region. And I have nothing but admiration for Rob Barr, the, uh, his team and his process that have, is sponsored by the local governments of the city of Ottawa, the city of Gatineau, and of course the National Capital Commission that will be bringing forward their recommendations and I think they will be progressive recommendations over the next year. And in fact, if you look a little bit more generally uh, from the planning perspective, uh, you'll also see that the NCC is doing a parallel planning initiative to update the plan for Canada's capital as well as the urban lands master plan. So I dare say that within the coming year, maybe 18 months at the outside, uh, it may be absolutely uh, pivotal times here in the national capital because of this important planning work. And I am very, very glad that I can say that because the race for sustainability is heating up in many, many places around the world. And I could use examples from all over the world to illustrate my point or my many points tonight. The carbon neutrality targets of such cities as Copenhagen and Oslo are absolutely remarkable and they're starting to yield great results. The Mazdar initiative uh, to have a carbon and waste neutral community of 100,000 people, workers and uh, residents in the capital of the United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi city where I work is another inspiration. And I've even noticed in Washington DC that they've taken off on a very creative process for one of the big areas near the capital to create what they're calling an eco district that might one day match the performance of Hammersby, the eco neighborhood in Stockholm. I've seen extraordinary communities in the Netherlands, especially in and around Amsterdam that are pushing the boundaries. But the fact is that one of the biggest potentials for Ottawa uh, and in, in, in its quest to become a green capital is that Canadians are really good at this and that we are acknowledged at being good at this around the world. We're good at city building and we're good at city management. In the PowerPoint that I'm showing you today, you'll notice a lot of images from my files, mostly of obviously from my home city of Vancouver, but I could show you similar examples throughout our country. And you can find real green experts all across Canada. It is really a very Canadian thing. Now, I said a moment ago that the formula for sustainability has to have many forms in all different kinds of areas of the city. And I think that that is relevant here in the diverse circumstances of Ottawa. Uh, let's go into, therefore, in the next few minutes, uh, looking at the contemporary city in its various areas. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about some of the themes that you see in cities across the country in regard to the development of core cities, in regard to the development of small towns that are usually on the edge of cities, uh, and of course the biggest dilemma of all in regard to the suburb. So let me start with the urban news. I see a very clear progress being made in the urban centers right across our country. I dare say the core cities of Canada are actually at this point in a revival. And the key themes for that are very, very relevant to what Ottawa needs to do to be green. The downtown repopulation uh, trends that you see in Vancouver, in Toronto, in Calgary, in Edmonton, in Halifax, just to name a few of the cities that I know something about, uh, are pretty much now unstoppable. Even with the economic downturn that we've, uh, that we've seen, the demograph uh, demogra demographic trends are helping us and increasingly a refined planning architecture and urban design prowess is also helping us in these places by putting an emphasis right back on quality. You'll see that's a big strong theme uh, as we move through this presentation. The public realm improvements here in Ottawa uh, uh, or the center of Montreal or even frankly in Saskatoon and in many other communities across the country are sensational. Uh, Rene Daus, for example's work in Montreal is inspirational to any Canadian and could and should be inspirational here in, in Ottawa as well. And in most of these transformations 
you generally see several typical policies that are at work that these jurisdictions know have to be pushed very hard in order to get the results that they're starting to get. So let me just tell you about some of those. First, this is about an embracing policy for intensive development. This is about talking about height uh, and density uh, to give an economic edge to developers and consumers in competition with the suburbs. In Vancouver, we go all the way. We say density is our friend uh, because we know that once you get into uh, dense situations, you give opportunities then for people to, uh, to give up the car uh, and to enjoy a very different way of living on a day-to-day -day basis. This is also about arranging all new development into identifiable and functional neighborhood units with the right array of amenities, such as this list you see here, and with the right mix and scale, this being some of the targets that one generally sees. And very often with a rewarding return to that old-fashioned concept of the neighborhood commercial high street to serve the everyday needs within minutes of people's homes. This is about uh, ample green space and usable park space in the city. And this is about using green roofs everywhere. Now, Chicago will tell you they become green just because of green roofs. That may be overstating the case. But the fact is green roofs are a part of this new formula. And this is almost always about social and economic mix because it takes very special action to hold places in the dynamically changing city for the less advantaged and also for families. And the return in particular of families with children to the city center, in my opinion, is the real gauge of success in these areas. But we also, we've learned, sometimes in the hard way, that this will not happen by accident. And with all of these measures that I've just listed, I'm going back to that concept I mentioned before. The essential byproduct is proximity among a maximum range of activities uh, and with less moving around, simply less moving around than we have taken for granted in the 20th century. So that's a very important underlying proposition uh, to everything we've been trying to do. But you know, we do still move around uh, and we have to find a way around uh, in these new places. So we need new kinds of policies and priorities related to movement uh, that is not going to be uh, primarily uh, provided by the car. Foremost, of course, about an introduction of alternatives to the car, especially as much transit as you can manage uh, and transit of all kinds and all speeds uh, and as much emphasis as you can manage on cycling, but more than anything, I think, on walking. And with this usually comes at the other side of the equation, some calming of the existing traffic, cut back on parking requirements, limitations on growth of the automobile infrastructure. Now, I've noticed across the country, uh, as compared to years ago when we first started talking about this, that this is not about removing the car from the urban scene. Rather, it's more about limiting its pervasiveness and its impacts in the urban scene. Let's face it, most people have some kind of degree of personal mobility that they're interested in, some little tiny tykes like that. So the advantages of the car are just too great for most people to just abandon it. But we have also learned that they will see the advantages of other modes if the circumstances are right, if the options are uh, available, and if it's convenient and inexpensive. And in Vancouver, again, we may have gone further than other places when we say congestion is our friend. Because once that congestion starts to happen, people start being more careful about decisions about where they're going to live and where they're going to work. And finally, the new progressive urbanism in our inner cities is about a careful and managed urban design. To go with the new intensity and the new lifestyle patterns, we've come to understand that the quality design and quality construction mean everything to the consumer. I'll come back to this a little later. Essentially, the formula, though, works like this. The quality design 
allows the density to work and to be uh, attractive for consumers. The density then generates great economic value and profits. And then that value helps to pay for amenities and for facilities that that community needs, such as this wonderful new school uh, in downtown Vancouver, all of which has the effect of enticing people back to a truly urban lifestyle. And this lifestyle is a much, much more sustainable lifestyle. Now, needless to say, I'm not, I don't want to paint too positive of a picture here. We still have a long way to go in our core cities. There are many, many issues. Uh, we have a lot to fix. But overall, I feel confident that the models are out there in any city in our country that can be harvested for the revival of any other city. And that makes me quite optimistic. And of course, that means there are a lot of models out there for the inner city of Ottawa as well. Now, let me move from there to the other end of the equation, to the smaller communities. I've recently heard about a very fascinating, fascinating initiative in one small town that could guide, I think, all of our thinking. It's quite interesting. I was at a national conference in Montreal a few months ago where I listened to a truly inspirational story of a little town called Eden Mills, Ontario. I don't know if you know about Eden Mills. It's a great little town. It's a little town of uh, no more than about a thousand, I don't even think there are a thousand people, who has declared its intention to become the first carbon neutral village in all of North America. Now, the village was quite smart. It started with its biggest advantage, which is that everyone knows everyone else. So they organized all the village people around the green dream. They got literally everyone involved in all kinds of things working from a community base. They didn't wait for government. They're not looking for institutional support and government support. They just went right down to the community and said, we can do this uh, ourselves. They also realized that, you know, basically the scale and the structure of their little town was pretty good. If they could add a little bit of social diversity into the equation, if they can enhance the walking and biking facilities a little bit, they would be in a pretty good position toward their goal. So the big drive in their plan for a green Eden Mills has been to attack the infrastructure side in terms of energy and water and waste management. And their focus is very much on the consumer dimension of this. So I urge you to go to their website and hear the, see the total story. It's, it's just a very compelling story. But let me just tell you a few things that they've done. First is they've audited their schools and their community facilities in regard to waste and energy use. And they're changing all of that. They have a program to urge individual people to winterize their homes for more efficient uh, energy performance. They have a very big program to teach people to simply stop, stop wasting things and to be conserving in all aspects of their day-to-day -day lives with a very big emphasis in this whole program on children, knowing if they can develop patterns among children, that'll carry on well into adulthood. Now, I don't know if they have met yet, I don't think they have their sustainability goals, but their strategy and their techniques can be taken up by any small town for both community benefit and, frankly, for individual people's benefits as well. And I think the smaller villages uh, at the edge of greater Ottawa could learn a lot from that little town of Eden Mills. But I think you know the big city, the small town, everything that I've been talking about over the last few minutes really leaves the biggest challenge untouched. Of course, I'm talking about the shape and nature of our suburbs. And this is where the battle against greenhouse gas emissions has to be fought and won. Now, in showing you these next few pictures, I'm not going to be telling you where these are from. Uh, you know, that would be a bad thing to talk about some particular town. They could, in fact, be uh, taken from any city in our country. You add a little few trees, you change the topography a bit. Every city in our country has many, many examples uh, like these images. They are quite metaphorical images to hopefully make my point. We're going to have to do a major reinvention of the suburbs as a grand national mission 
over the next few generation or next few years or i would say the next generation if we really want to affect climate change and ironically and sadly this is one of the areas where we have few real usable tangible and proven solutions at this point in time so i hope this is one of the strongest messages that i leave tonight about ottawa but now having said this we're also going to have to be very careful about how we do this. This cannot be a struggle to disavow the suburbs and suburban life, which is what the, the commentary has pretty much been about over the last few years. This cannot be about bad-mouthing the suburbs. This has got to be a struggle about realizing the new potential of suburban life that is consistent with smart growth, certainly, uh, that brings much higher levels of proximity and the ur other urban qualities that I've been describing, uh, and that will be sustainable over the long run, but that frankly is done in ways that, that suburban people can accept. So here's the kind of strategy, uh, some of the things that I think uh, have to be on that agenda. Now there are some very obvious answers uh, to start with, and they have to do with what I call the natural urbanite. This woman and her child, I believe, are the natural urbanite. They, these are people for whom a sustainable life choice will be a, a good choice, a, 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 almost a spontaneous choice, but they don't necessarily want to be in the urban core. So in their case, the move for transit-oriented development centers and housing over shops along commuter routes and the connection of the town centers by rapid transit, these will be smart moves. They will draw that consumer. For example, I think there is a huge potential in those giant parking lots uh, around the old shopping malls that you see in every suburban uh, part of our country. As this particular example shows, it's not all that difficult to make these into genuine communities uh, th that really use all that old parking area for something a lot better. And uh, all of this, I'm quite convinced uh, that in doing it, the real art is to make it attractive for most people by bringing it into a mid-scale so that the new places fit a lot more comfortably into the low-scale surrounding uh, uh, that, that's already there and are appealing to people who are just not interested in that really high scale. I think some of the work on the corridor schemes in Toronto is interesting. Vancouver's idea, not so much uh, the exact scale of this, but the idea of the shop house in a modern form. Uh, here's one where the houses are just above uh, a big uh, grocery store. These are some of the ideas, and we need a very rich invention of ways to bring that middle scale back to the table in these suburban areas. But, you know, I think we have to be frank uh, and we have to know that most people have chosen the suburbs because the frenetic lifestyle and the scale of the city is just not for them. Uh, the services aren't right for their families. They just felt there were too many risks. They fled the urban cores for a reason. They don't want big city life. But the other side of that equation is that there's a lot of evidence that their suburban destination really didn't turn out the way they were hoping for either. It also hasn't been satisfying. Often, the supposed lifestyle benefits have been found to be an illusion. And that's because the real fact is, the dirty truth is, that we have not been designing these places from the point of view of preferred living conditions or experience as long as anyone can remember. These communities are laid out by rote. Uh, they've been the, in a, they're, they're, they're the result of a deep rut of public policy. Uh, road and street design standards that were invented way back in the 1950s when everyone thought the car was the solution to everything. Subdivision lot standards and patterns also from the 1950s. Exclusionary residential zoning from the 1950s as well that keep these places very sterile and corporate building standards starting in the 1950s and expanded more recently in the big box uh, formats that we have been told is the bottom line requirement for retail development out in these communities. In fact, once government, local government sets the land use allocations, 
then they'll often tell you they're not very involved in the actual physical shape of these places. And I just think we can't accept that. And there are really two thrusts that have to be on this agenda. We have to do better greenfield development when we do it, and we have to do lots of infill development. First, we will continue, uh, I think, to expand into new greenfield sites uh, in times and different places. And when we do it, we have to make sure that the right patterns are put in place from the beginning. If they continue to produce something like this, we have to just have a ritual burning of all the old street standards and all the old codes, and we just have to throw away the transportation models. Jane Jacobs once said to me, just throw away the transportation model. It's useless uh, for what we really need to achieve. And as an alternative, I think we need to be inspired by those wonderful pre-1930s inner suburbs that exist in every single one of our cities, where all the standards were more humane, where the streets were narrower and safer, where maturity has really brought about some effective patterns of diversity, and where social networks show us that community action and self-help can be engendered by neighborhood form. We have to take this aback from the engineers and the special interest professionals that have controlled the suburbs for far too long. But we also have to be, we have to be very clear. Uh, the fact is that even if tomorrow morning we started to build our cities very correctly for sustainability, because we only add about 1% to the urban mass every year, there's not gonna be a fundamental change in time for the calamity that we could face. And the most urban jo uh, urgent job of everything that I've talked about is really that job of dealing with uh, retrofitting the existing suburban situation. And so I think this is the second big thrust on that suburban agenda. Retrofit really requires a very clever use of infill schemes that will add the missing aspects for sustainable suburbanization in existing places at the scale that local people will tolerate. As a start, for example, I think the easy moves are such things as legalizing secondary suites, uh, rear yard and laneway uh, housing. Then, of course, there's the micro lot subdivisions. There are the zero lot line schemes. There are row houses in some places that will fit. There are live work spaces over shops. Planners tend to talk about this these days as invisible density, and hidden density and gentle density. It's a, it's a game of really moving from that 10 units per acre, which is typical, to only as high as 40 units per acre, which Jack Diamond, the famous architect from Toronto, has said many times is the threshold working density for sustainable urban structure and more importantly, probably, for sustainable movement. And then, of course, we have to fold in the connective tissue in the form of pedestrian upgrades and bikeways and better bus links to tra rapid transit and reconnecting all the cul-de-sacs for a better street grid. And by the way, none of this requires big demolition or displacement or neighborhood destabilization. And what's really cool is that it could offer very significant profits for individual small sitting owners and, and, and residents, rather than just seeing the transformation done by big developers who come in, do their thing, leave, uh, and take the profits without necessarily having to live with the uh, implications. So I certainly hope that, uh, that this hodgepodge of ideas is something that uh, will offer some opportunities here in Ottawa, and I'll come back to this uh, as I close my presentation in a moment. But you know, there is another contradiction in all of this that we have to tackle. A and I suspect if we don't tackle it, the rest is just gonna be talking among the converted. We have to ask a very hard question. Is the public really with us on all of this? Will they change their life patterns and their habits to do what needs to be done for 
the kind of ecological footprint that we're going to need in the future. I, I hear people say, I hear planners say, you know, everyone's simply going to have to do things differently in the future. They'll have no choice. And usually they add, especially if oil prices peak. But is that really true? After all, you know, we live in a free society. We have guaranteed personal freedoms. People will listen. This is my experience. But they're going to do whatever they want to do. And frankly, as people become wealthier, uh, we've seen them buy the luxuries that they want and the pleasures that they want. And they can really put off the impacts of rising oil costs for a very long time. And I think we have to face the fact that the kind of city that people like me talk about, one that has all those sustainable qualities at whatever scale, that kind of city has so far proven to be not too popular among the great majority of Canadians. As one sardonic Canadian mayor has said, the only thing that the public hates more than sprawl is intensification. So, you know, let's be blunt. Most people hate density because most of it has been just so horrible. They hate mixed use. Uh, because they see it hitting them negatively. To them, diversity is unsafe. Transit is something people try once, but you know, it's not in their vocabulary because it's usually not very comfortable and it's not very convenient. If the lights were up, I would do a survey and I would ask you a question. I would say, you know, how many of you live at high density? How many of you uh, live next door to low income people? How many of you uh, ride transit every day to work? And in almost any Canadian audience, the answer would be 10 to 15 percent if I was lucky. Now, if they're students, it's a little higher, but in the average Canadian audience, those are the kinds of percentages that I would expect. But I have to say, honestly, that to some degree, I understand the consumer at this point. I, I really sympathize with the average person's predicament because the communities that we have been building since the war have seemed to be more of a trade-off of the dream as density increases. It's offered more like a consolation prize of life, uh, and that's often what it's actually been. And I think we have to change that. And I think we can change that by coming back to the basics of what people want and what people need out of city life. And really, the famous urbanist uh, Jan Gell, who was here from Denmark, who was here just a few months ago, uh, put it very well. He calls it making people cities with a people scale seen at eye level at about five kilometers per hour, back to the fundamentals of human scale. And some of you will know that I call this experiential planning. This is about learning what people want and then carefully designing the community to deliver the tangible direct experiences that people are telling us about that they want in their lives and for their families and for their children every day. And these become the individual incidents, the fragments from which the urban pattern is then built up in layer upon layer. And my hypothesis is that we can build up a desirable and preferred experience for them. They will want that experience in a sustainable form, a sustainable package. We can make this a genuine attraction. And this has to have really two fundamental aspects. First, it has to take a consumer focus to define what needs to be done in our city. And second, it has to take a very strong urban design focus at the, a basic level to realize those consumer hopes and expectations in a sustainable form. And these factors, in turn, require several essential qualities of governance. These are qualities that I don't think can be denied. So let me just quickly list them. First, we must have an absolute dedication to citizen uh, involvement in framing and deciding on all the urban strategies at every level. Government has to think of people as consumers and not just as voters. Second, there must be a shift from government business confrontation in the urban affairs of any place to an extensive pattern of cooperation and collaboration. And of course, citizens have to be an equal part of those, uh, they have to be equal partners in this. We have been wasting way too much time and, and resources in the battles, and we need in the future to work together. Third, a regulatory regime at the local level must be a place where there is a lot of discretion. 
with a very light touch on the hard rules and a lot of guidelines and incentives and bonuses uh, for the saying what uh, the community wants and what kind of contributions and performance and then giving opportunities for that to happen. And this regula regulatory framework has to be what I call a wealth creation mechanism. It has to create genuine new wealth, not just be a policing uh, mechanism for a minimum standard. And last, there must be an adjudication process for development that re-empowers the creative people in our country. The architects, the landscape architects, the urban designers to offer their most engaging, most inventive solutions rather than asking them or pushing them to fall back on blunt and often outdated codes and standards. You know, we talk about uh, overconsumption, we talk about unsustainable consumption, but we forget that for most people, you know, you only get one chance in this life. And there is always a degree of personal fulfillment in the choices that people want to make. So I would dare suggest that we have to offer an attractive green set of options to people that they will value on a very personal basis that they will see as personally fulfilling and a lifestyle that then that they would, because of that, genuinely prefer and therefore will buy in the market and will vote for at the polls. So what might all of this mean for Ottawa and for that aspiration that I highlighted at the beginning uh, to make Ottawa a true green national capital? I will leave the Choosing Our Future team to put forward you know, the actual coherent framework for all of this. Instead, let me concentrate on a very few specific ideas, specific things that seem to me to be readily evident. Uh, and you might see these as suggestions or as illustrations from a practical perspective that I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, from watching this in other cities around the world, would take the national capital in the right direction. So I'll close this evening with eight fast ideas in eight short minutes that I hope will foster a discussion and debate in the context of the more deep discussion of choosing our future. And they're not in any kind of priority order. But here they are. First, let's recognize that we have in fact now jumped right over the green belt and we're starting to sprawl out of control. So I propose that we define a new urban growth boundary for the 21st century that can limit that sprawl, but that also will preserve the identity and integrity of the small communities and the villages out at the urban fringe and beyond, and keep that rural experience within the reach uh, of all the region's population. And we can achieve this boundary in many ways, but I think a new kind of green belt might be in order using the American land trust model, or maybe the British Columbia model of the agricultural land reserves, where agricultural land that is in use is reserved by law and can't be converted to other uses. The point is that it's necessary to have a green belt, I believe, but it is not necessary to buy all the land to have that green belt in a very modern, contemporary way. Second, I want to sing the praises of the current green belt that is in place and has been growing for half a century. I propose that we pr aggressively preserve this green asset, not so much as a belt. I don't think it makes sense as a green belt anymore, but now and in future as an ecological lung that allows the city to generate and breathe clean air, that offers growth potential for nearby close-in food production on an incremental personal basis, and that clearly demarks the urban from the suburban parts of Ottawa, and that provides a, an important recreational amenity of world stature and world uniqueness where it really counts. And I think, from where I'm looking at it, the green, green belt is one of the most vital and most valuable assets in the Commonwealth of the capital. It enables, in fact, population growth because it provides the respite for that population when they come in to live. Uh, and so this asset should not, in my opinion, be frittered away. I have no problem with crossing it in mass transportation 
or developing parts of it for active residential use rather than passive country, or even allowing parts of it for public use, uses that need very big site. But all I'm saying is don't build over it. Don't give it away to random growth as the English did with the London Greenbelt over two decades ago, and I will tell you, most Londoners regret that at this point. Third, I would urge an aggressive repopulation of the urban core of both Ottawa and Gatineau. And I would dare say as high as two-thirds of the future urban growth in this region should go within the existing Greenbelt footprint, and much of this should be pulled as close in to the urban cores of these municipalities as possible. There are already very livable places, and they could be made even more so with careful community-based planning and development management. You know, we want to make them urban and hip and fun. You know, Ottawa, for example, already has a design review process that can be brought to bear to, to bring up the standards of every urban development by bringing in advice from your very best architects and designers. And there are some very big and attractive sites that are ready for comprehensive redevelopment, like the incredible Le Breton's Flat site, just to name one. Uh, you know, I really can't wait until you start to see this happening in our national capital. It could be one of the best places in the entire nation to live. It could be, in fact, a real mecca. Fourth, let's take advantage of the suburban infrastructure and the social networks that are already in place in these very pleasant suburbs of Ottawa. I propose that a, a deliberate process begin to very gently intensify and infill the suburban communities in the capital region. And all of the, the strategies, the, particularly the low-scale strategies that I've been talking about, uh, I think can be brought to bear, especially with a massive uh, partnership with local community people that is it focused more on addressing their needs and their current deficiencies through what I would really talk about, which is completing their community. You know, it's often said that Ottawa, like every other national capital city in the world, needs to be in a leadership role in fashioning ways of doing things that can then assist the entire country. Well, I believe the reinvention of suburbia here in Ottawa would make Ottawa not only a model for the country, but the envy of the country. So I would hope that this would be an initiative that would, in fact, bring the national government right into a financial partnership supporting what needs to be done. Fifth, I would add my voice to those trying so hard to expand the transit infrastructure here in Ottawa. This is an absolute must if you really look beyond the roadblocks and the political difficulties of the moment uh, and pay attention instead to the, the competitive requirements of the city later in the century. We know that transportation is a big part of competition and it's also a big part of the ecological problem we face. Those cities that keep up with transit growth uh, will enjoy clear competitive advantages in drawing economic development and consumer power in the future. Those that don't will simply be left behind. And I think this means getting on with the alignments which are currently under debate and discussion, currently on the drawing boards. This means adding as many new alignments as possible uh, to build a plan that's relevant over the next hundred years. This means adding the smaller feeder transit options and the community-based transit networks, such as streetcars. This means improving the transit experience in every mode to make transit not only an option, but a preference for consumers. We need to add entertainment and education offerings and price advantages for the major users and, and comfort at waiting places and much better travel information. The experts call it transportation demand management. Six, looking at the very other side of the same equation, I recommend that we put the entire automobile infrastructure in this region on a diet. There's no doubt to me that we need a few new connections. There, there's some bridging the river that does need to be done. There's certainly some linking of disconnected parts of the street system that need to be done. But beyond that, I propose that we start to emphasize traffic calming and essentially put the brakes on road expansion and that endless battle for the street cross-section. 
My friend, the urbanist Alan Jacobs, said it best, really. He said, you know, everyone has to compromise in their use of the street area. And then you can bring the same ideas of transportation demand management into the equation, this side of the equation. We need more community-focused pedestrian areas and more street sharing and less investment in those traffic management devices. If we can get the automobile converted to green fuel, then it will make even more progress uh, in the city here. Seventh, we have to fundamentally change one giant government policy that has been in place for 40 years for very good reasons at the time it was invented, but that has had a distorting effect on the growth of the capital region as much as any other single thing. Of course, I'm talking about the policy to concentrate government employment into the major, what are called federal government employment nodes that now dot the region with huge numbers of people working in them, but often with very poor connections to other places and with absolutely no land use diversity. And many people will tell you that these are very unpleasant places to work, uh, but the real harm is that they essentially force people into their cars. They are anything but providing proximity in regard to the relationship between home and work. We need to take these employment nodes apart and infill them or reconstruct them as mixed-use, diverse, and interesting urban places where government and other workers can enjoy jobs and housing uh, and commerce and recreation and street life very close together. Proximity has to be treasured, as my uh, colleague from New Zealand has so well said. At the moment, we have some very wonderful opportunities in many of these places. But this is going to take an initiative at the national level, directly from the federal government, because I can tell you from personal experience that the ministries of the Crown, and particularly Public Works Canada, will tell you they can't really do these innovative concepts with the nodes until the government changes the development rules. I would argue that's an afternoon in cabinet, and that's what it should be. And then my eighth and last uh, proposal relates really to the seventh. I propose that we use at least one of these federal government employment nodes or, or another uh, site if possible to do a state-of-the-art world model for a sustainable urban community that's super green. Let's do what the Athletes Village for the Olympics did in Vancouver. Let's go all the way in managing energy and water and waste and green construction and uh, uh, urban agriculture and add in even environmental learning. Surely we can match Washington's eco-district proposal. We can use Stockholm's Hammersby as a takeoff point. And we can call upon the expertise of world-renowned people in our own country who have already done some of the very few lead platinum communities extent in the world today. Those federal employment nodes are totally in government hands, so the opportunities are here and now and real. And you've already seen, I'm talking about Tunney's Pasture, I'm talking about Confederation Heights, these are just uh, several of the examples. I would urge the federal government to make these sites a national priority project bringing in all the experts and resources into play in partnership with the local government, the NCC, the local neighbors, and all the NGO interest groups uh, of the city. This could be the creative flashpoint for thousands of people in the city, citizens and business and government, to explore and operationalize the very best green ideas in the world and the most profitable development in the world and in the city. Now, you know, I, I've only had eight ideas. There are obviously many more ideas that need to be explored for a green city. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it will take everything that we can do to really shift things to green. That's one of the key messages of a colleague of mine, Dr. Bill Reese, who is the Canadian inventor, a very brilliant guy, the Canadian inventor of the ecological footprint. But I hope that my ideas can be seen as a practical part of that aspiration to make Ottawa truly the greenest national capital in the world. But let me close perhaps on a gentler note. Let me celebrate the need for beauty in all that we do to find a green sustainable future 
for our capital city. I can't fail but to recognize the remarkable job our National Capital Commission does with the embellishment of, of Ottawa. Confederation Boulevard, Parliament Hill, Gatineau Park, the Tulip Festival, and all the other programs and events that are such a memorable part of the capital experience that really touches our hearts. And that has to be one of the most pronounced aspects of a green national capital, and in fact, of any green city in the world. You see, tomorrow's green city must certainly meet the environmental test, it has to meet the economic test, it has to meet the social test, but more than anything, it has to meet the experiential test, and that is the test of the heart. It must be beautiful and joyful and sociable and humane and a little mysterious and offer a complete, rich community life with all the subtleties of human occupation. It's simply got to have that wow factor. And when we achieve that, then sustainability will start to be a natural trend because people will prefer it in their everyday choices, not because it's good for the planet, but because they truly feel it's good for them. And in the end, the drive for a green capital will not be decided in the chambers of parliament or at city hall. It will be decided in the living rooms and the kitchens of every consumer family here in Ottawa. My point it is that it will be the people of Ottawa that create the greenest national capital in the world. It will be the people. Thank you. I grew up in Vancouver. I've lived in Halifax, Toronto, Ottawa's home. I'm an urban planner um, in private practice. In all my time living in other Canadian communities, I've never, and I think you were preaching to the choir here, and I've been at other public meetings, there's, there's something about Ottawa where they really, the intensity and the, the density that we're all trying to do for the greater good, they're just, they're so against it. I mean, can you offer any advice? <laughs> well, you know, when I started my, my work in Vancouver, I could have said the same thing, except I hadn't lived in so many Canadian cities, uh, but I could have said the same thing. The fact is that it's not unusual in this city. This city is not unusual in this country. Uh, a lot of people are against the kind of density and intensity and frenetic qualities that we have seen in the big cities of the 20th century. A lot of people are against the lack of safety, they're against the the dirt, they're against the, uh, you know, all kinds of things. They could tell you a litany of things. And you know what? We haven't been taking those seriously. We haven't been actually addressing those issues. What we do is we're disdainful. We say they're nimbious. That's what we call them. We've got a, a term for it now. Uh, and we therefore write them off. Well, you know what they do? They just ignore us. They go to the polls. And they do what they would do at the, will do at the polls. What we have to do is begin to engage in a real conversation with the people in this city, a dreaming conversation, not one that's you know, always such a struggle of politics and you know, all of that, but a dreaming conversation about what lifestyle that they really want. What, is it, what are the qualities of it? And you're gonna be surprised because even in Dallas, Texas, I'm uh, you know, an urban designer in Dallas, Texas, you know, that place makes this place look real urban. But even in Dallas, Texas, when you sit down and you really talk to people about their life experience, many of the things they want are not being delivered by their current life experience. And you can start to show them the linkages between a quality urbanism and that preferred experience. And secondly, you can convert your own ideas of what that quality urbanism is because our ideas have been not good ideas for most Canadians. And that's why they're not there. We are a very rich country, we're a very free country, we buy what we want. We haven't been buying the ideas of people like me in this room. But there was a, they, that can happen. I will tell you, and I, you know, let me testify from my own experience, the market quality of Vancouver, the ideas that were in, implemented there, the quality of life that was implemented there is incredibly high. I did a post-occupancy evaluation, 91% of the people 
are at either the high satisfaction or super high satisfaction uh, of living there. And those were all suburban people that came, you know, there from some suburban place. Well, why? Because we figured out what they actually wanted. You know, we looked at them as consumers and we worked from that basis. And that's really my advice. I don't think it's about, you know, importing a Vancouver idea here. But it is about starting a genuine discussion here uh, with people and, you know, having your best architects and landscape architects and others in that discussion so that they can, you know, conjure up from that discussion what this might look like. And then insinuating into that discussion the sustainability themes and showing people the linkages between the bad weather and the way that uh, our, our cities are built. And I think that has potential. You have to be optimistic about it. That's what you really have to be. Yes. Thank you for that. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, my question is about electricity. We're hoping, it's, well, it's two things. We're all hoping that we can all reduce our power consumption, but at the same time, we're all also hoping for electric cars. Um, Powering your electric car will probably mean drawing more off the energy grid. I was just wondering if you had come across any solutions for, I know I've read a little bit about using the car's battery as a, a way of storing the electricity that you could maybe harvest from solar. But then the second part of my question is, in Canada, our main challenge is, I mean, a place like Mazda, they have fields of solar panels at their disposal. They have a lot of sunshine, even in the southern states. Here we have some limitations. Um, have you come across that? Uh, let me commend you to uh, go to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I think they call it their automobile uh, laboratory. I, I, don't, I won't have that right, but I'm sure if you go on the web, you'll discover it. I was at, uh, in Houston a while back, and they presented which uh, something I thought was very remarkable. It was, in fact, a car that its own movement generated energy. And then that energy went into the grid, actually the car generated energy going into the grid and then used whatever energy it needed to get moving again. And then it, it ended up being much more sustainable. The, the one thing that is the uh, ugly, untalked about truth as I understand it of electric cars is that in most cities, once you get beyond a few thousand, the grid's not gonna carry it. And so we know that you have to step back from, you know, it's a good idea to have an electric car, but you have to step back and say, you know, how are we going to generate that electricity? Now, if you're in Quebec or in British Columbia, most of that, gen uh, that electricity is generated by much more uh, passive techniques through hydro. But if you're in the rest of our country, it's using fossil fuels. And so I think that we do have to continue to explore those alternatives that are much lower energy and try to perhaps convert the car into an energy source. That seems to be what the, the uh, really fascinating theme in, at MIT is. So I commend you to look at, into that uh, because it's, it's really one of the big problems. I have to say, having come from the place that, you know, I went through the whole time of thinking maybe we could design a city that was so great that you wouldn't need your car. I've come to the place that we're still gonna need some cars. Uh, I will say this, what I found, this is fascinating in Vancouver where, and it's true in Toronto too, uh, where, uh, and I think Montreal, but for sure in Vancouver I know the statistics, where uh, you do make intensive development, very high quality, people do start giving up their car. 60% of the trips of downtown Vancouver are taken by walking now. And the number of cars coming into the city is less. It's been going down by a significant amount every year uh, because of these policies. Um, I also have noticed, and I think consumers are going to notice pretty soon, that if you can cash out a, qua a car, maybe it's only one of your two, or three, or four, but if you can cash out a car, you can sustain a mortgage of about $100,000 more when interest rates were higher. We did that study. Uh, so, you know, if, you can, if we can offer a city that where, uh, you know, maybe you keep one car for a family but not two or three, that's a pretty good aspiration. And the families can really benefit. They can afford to buy uh, more expensive products. And by the way, what they're buying is an investment product, not a consumer product. So there, you know, there, there is going to be, there, there is hopefully going to be less use of the car generally, but.
but to the extent we use the car, I think we have to look for alternative energy. And that was the non-expert's answer, by the way. I'm not an expert on that topic. Do you find, uh, do you find in Vancouver that you have good publications? Uh, I find in Ottawa that uh, the idea of having a, an initiative that would be like talking about green initiatives and smart growth, we, we just don't write about it at all. And, and whether, like, so do you, is, do your newspapers do something like once a month that talk about smart growth? Because I think people don't like change. And if they started just reading it in a non-confrontational fashion, they might start to go, hey, that makes sense. Probably not much better than Ottawa. Uh, I, I wouldn't say as, as any more systematic. What I will say is that the municipality sponsors more publications about this. But I think the answer to the communication rests in our language. I think a lot of the words in use are putting people off. Uh, I think that uh, we will have much more progress in, in convincing people about things if we can convert some of this back to what they care about. Now, this has been all about what we care about. Uh, and I think instead that it has to be what they care about. In a community planning circumstance, the best progress that we have had is when our communication shifted to what you need to do for the planet, you dumb idiot, to what do you need for your family? What do you need for your children? How, how are you going to live in the, in the community when you don't want to be in your big house? And you s put those kind of issues on the table. The fact that it achieves our sustainability goals, that's good. And maybe at some point you know, there will be a growing consciousness and endorsement of that. But I don't think we need to use that language. It's interesting, I learned this from a politician, you learn about language from politicians. Uh, years ago, a politician, a mayor said to me, Larry, whenever you come to council, never use the word street wall. We hate the word street wall. It means everything we hate, so don't use it. Now he said, you can come with street walls, just don't call them that. And so we, you know, we came up with the podium and the townhouse and the you know, domesticity, and we came up with all the words that everyone loved and we just didn't use street wall for five years. And then I felt uh, you know, good when a politician used the word. And I thought, okay, it's okay. We can use the word street wall again. And I think that's what some of these words need to be. They need to go into hibernation for a while. And let's find some words that actually link in with the real heart of our citizens. It's a little coincidental that my favorite developer, but. Uh, I'm going to ask a question about developers. I mean, this is a social, you basically talked about social engineering in a lot of ways, but where's the economic engineering that needs to be done um, with regards to the influence uh, and the power around us? I mean, there's some monkey wrenching happening on some really good people, I mean, I mean good, good committees. And, and that's, uh, what have you seen? Wh where can we go with that? Like, there needs to be something that could quantify or qualify great developers like like Doug, for instance. W well, how can we publicize the other ones? Well, uh, let me go to the first part of that question. I'm, I'm kind of glad you brought it up because I didn't emphasize it in this presentation. I did emphasize it more yesterday with our, uh, our workshop with the city council. I firmly believe, and the experience uh, in my practice has been, that when you deliver quality, sustainable products in the right way, you make more money. If you can take a product which you're, you know, you're bringing to market, I'm now talking just in old-fashioned marketing terms. If you can take a product you're bringing to market and, the, and your market segment is like this, and you can widen the market segment out to this for that product, two things happen. The product goes up in value, and more people want to buy the product. And that means that there is an economic opportunity. Now the problem is that we have the forces that can widen that market segment working against one another right now. The municipality, uh, let me just go back. The, the consumer wants a lifestyle. They're not just buying a house. If you, if you look at smart marketing people, they don't say, here's a nice three bedroom unit. 
they say, here's a wonderful place to live, and they show you all the wonderful things about it, and you're enticed because you, most consumers, are looking for a, a quality lifestyle. They, and they mean this seriously. They want it for their families. It's not, you know, it's not superficial. They want better for their families. So if you can take those and you can build your product into that, now a, a municipality can do part the developer can't do. A municipality can manage the whole public part of the environment. It can deliver services and facilities. The developer can do something a municipality can't do. It can deliver very good private facilities, but it can also bring wealth to bear on delivery of public facilities because of the limited funding sources municipalities have. If you add to that a regulatory system that generates new wealth into the equation, genuine new wealth into the equation, then you have a financial force to drive building a market. And once that market starts to build, it takes off and has a life of its own. That's an absolute, you know, old-fashioned uh, economic reality. And you start to see very high levels of profitability. Uh, and in our case in Vancouver, I can tell you the development community has very high levels of profitability. They are not hurting. They are not poor. Uh, and we have hundreds of millions of dollars of public goods that are engendering neighborhoods that consumers who never thought of going to those places are now wanting to go to. As one real estate person said, it's become socially acceptable to live at higher densities and more sustainable forms. So I think that's, I think the, and I said this at City Hall yesterday, the public officials have to understand the economics of development as much as the private person who comes in to get a permission to do something. I teach my, I taught my staff in the city of Vancouver and I teach people all over the world, the public officials, about the simple concept of a development pro forma, for example, where you can see a model of a development, you can learn what wealth is at play, and you can learn how to maximize that wealth for the product and for the public. You know, we've lived in an illusion that if it's good for the private, it's not good for the public. If it's good for the public, it's not good for the private. That is an illusion. And my experience in Vancouver is 100% proof of that uh, because we have something good for the public and it's been excellent in the marketplace. And, you know, there's a lot we could say more about it, but hopefully that theme uh, sings through because I don't want you to see this presentation as something by some, you know, uh, airy-fairy person who has never thought about economics. It's the opposite. You don't get any of this in a, in a capitalist economy, which we, have, we are. You don't get it unless you can make these products profitable. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about um, how you plan to address, address Ottawa's winter climate. Uh, a lot of the photos in your presentation tonight were of you know, nice sunny weather. I mean, you know, getting out to, getting to transit or walking down to the store aren't really a daunting task but a lot of cities like Ottawa are kind of living in denial of this and designing for kind of temperate times of the year and, you know, they'll kind of hold through for the winter, but not ideally. And so what kind of considerations do you have just for kind of getting people out, getting people to work, using transit, that kind of things in the winter months? Yeah, it's a, that was asked at the city council yesterday as well. And I have to tell you, I always use nice pictures. It rains in Vancouver. You'll notice I didn't have a lot of rainy pictures. I never take rainy pictures. What can I say? But I do work in climates that are like Ottawa, too cold or too hot, or in my case in Vancouver, originally too rainy. You have to accept something which the 20th century didn't accept, and that is that there may be four months of a year where the walkable, walking culture isn't very comfortable. And so what in the 20th century they did because of that, they just didn't develop any accommodation for the walking culture for 12 months a year. But I don't like the idea that it's only four months a year. And that makes, what is it, the rest of the year that, could, that is, could have a wonderful walking culture. Uh, and yet we don't design for it. And that's true in every American city. You'll see cities that have no sidewalks if they're a hot city, where months and months and months it's beautiful to walk. Well, they just didn't build it. I learned that, you know, of all places from Montreal because I watched that Montreal has a, a wonderful walking street culture that goes inside for four months, that's okay. But it is outside, it is engendering a wonderful quality of the city for the rest of the time. In my work in Abu Dhabi, I'm just trying to convince them to put any walkability and 
street life into the equation uh, because I can tell you it is very nice for half the year. And the other half the year, you have to develop uh, alternatives. In climates where you have very ex big extremes, you need to develop sometimes parallel accommodations. Um, but in climates where you can, sometimes you can just expand the uh, period of the street life by a month or two on each side with some very simple measures. We just haven't been doing it. And where it is done, uh, the, the streets do come to life and, and you'll be amazed. People will sit in cold weather with you know, sweaters on. They just love to be outside. But if there's no place to sit, there's no place to walk, there's no place to be, and the only place that you're comfortable or safe is inside your car, well, that's what you're gonna get. It's that simple in my opinion. Oh. I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, I think you could improve your wonderful slides and presentation if you put in a couple of pictures of people wearing helmets when they're biking. Because in Ottawa, that's kind of the law. People mostly wear their eye helmets when they're biking. And I think it's a very good safety feature. And I think it'd be much improved if you, if you took a few of those pictures out and put ones in with people with helmets on. Like you, you could even um, start to take a picture of my neighbor in the winter time with his helmet on going to work. You know, it, it would sort of, uh, what was the guy suggesting about the um, making it more climate friendly, you know, the activity? So I would say improve your presentation by putting helmets on the bikers, please. Thank you. Next. Hi, my question is related to um, exit strategy of resolution when in urban planning, when community groups and city councils have a difficulty with a de uh, developers. So right now you may know in Ottawa there are 20 developers, I think, they're <coughs> at the OMB, Ontario Municipal Board. They're fighting the city on the urban boundary issue. I think they want 2,000 hectares added. The city wants under 200. So there you have 10 times difference probably to, to continue to promote the suburban dream of the single home. So I guess my question is, Ontario Municipal Board is a unique creature in Canada, I think. H how is it done in other places where there's more accountability, where citizens can appeal those decisions when they're bad decisions? We know that the OMB often favors developers. So the, the, they're unappointed, they're unelected, they're, un they're not accountable really, the OMB members. Often one person will sit, and I think on the Ottawa case, it's one panelist for the OMB hearing a very complex and a huge issue. So that's a problem. Why are there not three or five panelists? Why are there no clear mechanisms to appeal for communities? Often co communities have to pay the legal costs of the developers when they lose the case. This is absurd in a democratic sense. And how can this be? And maybe we need to make this a provincial election issue to the form of the OMB. There's a lot of community associations across our city complaining about this. It seems to be we go to Manitick, look what happened in Manitick, the big Minto development. You know, the OMB, you know, they decided in favor of Minto, the city fought that one, they lost. The city lawyer says they got a good <laughs> chance of winning this one, let's hope they win it. But what if they don't win it? And what happens in, let's say, BC? What, what's going on there and how, how, do we, how do we get control of our city and the design of our city back? I, I'm not against developers, I think they have obviously an important role, but how do we get the community interest back into the discussion? And why do we have to always be the NIMBYs versus the developers? You know, our city councillors are elected. They, they are accountable to us, and that's how it works in a democracy. And that's how it, you know, that's like, I just wonder how other jurisdictions do it, I guess is my question, maybe BC or internationally. Thank you. Okay, well, I would, uh, first I'll tell you my philosophy, and then I'll tell you what I know about the specifics. Uh, philosophically, I firmly believe that appeal mechanisms are, it's like the lowest common denominator of how we should resolve our differences. It's a situation when you have no engagement, no dialogue, no discussion, no facilitation, anything else. You have to have that one insurance policy that instead of something, someone going off and doing their own thing to everyone else discredit and disbenefit, there is at least this appeal mechanism. So what you do is you turn what should be a community conversation into litigation. And if you, I don't want to offend any lawyers here, but when you get into the drama of the law, it's often less about the issue than the law. And that's one of the big problems in the American system, they become so litigious. Uh, and that means that the issues are not being really debated at the level they should be debated. Now how do you do that? Well I think you do that, how do you get beyond that, I should say. 
Well, I think you do that by going way upstream and you begin to put in place very genuine processes of engagement from pe among people of different interests where the discussion is an interest-based discussion, not a positional discussion. I can tell you from hundreds, if not thousands, of negotiations that I've done through my career, that if I can move people from a position to a clear discussion of their interests, I can find common ground and ways to move forward among very divergent positions. That's something we know in every facet of negotiations in life, but we don't do it in the urban scene very much. So that means you need to invent new mechanisms. For example, in Vancouver, an idea that we got from Portland, Oregon, actually, we have what are called uh, good neighbor agreements. This is an agreement which is signed between a neighborhood's representatives and a developer, and sometimes a, someone who's gonna run an operation later that says, Here are the, here's the accord in which this is going to occur. Many, many issues don't have anything to do with the shape of something. It has to do with the management of it after the fact, transportation, noise, uh, you know, other things like that. And many of those things can be put into these good neighbor agreements, and then there are various ways that, I won't get into the technical details and all that, but there are various ways that they can be managed very effectively over time. Secondly, you need to have expertise in your city hall for actual mediation, facilitation, and interest-based problem solving. It's not, it doesn't happen by accident. It took me a lot of years to learn it, and people who know about it, you know, you'll know it takes a long time to learn it. And it's a very, it's a skill and an art, and you have to have that expertise. And thirdly, you have to have a local government who feels responsible for making the accords, for pulling people together, to making the, the, the a collaboration work. They have to endorse it by policy. They have to insist on it as political people. Uh, and that has to be way upstream. So if you have that, then you should find yourself into a position where you have less need for the appellant body. Now in British Columbia, in, in my, I'll say in Vancouver, which was a little unique in British Columbia, uh, we had a, um, uh, an appeal, bo uh, b appeal board in the municipality, but it couldn't, it actually couldn't make decisions when the discretion had been designated to an official. It could only make decisions under very, uh, uh, override decisions under very limited circumstance. In other words, what I'm trying to say is there was very limited appeal. And so therefore, it was essential that every step along the way provide the reconciliation before you got there, and then that left very little going to appeal. In many parts of the world, it's more like that. The Ontario Municipal Board, I think, is relatively unusual uh, in, in having something that is completely outside of a community, uh, completely not driven by that. And I'll say bluntly here, and I'll probably be you know, not invited back, I believe the Ontario Municipal Board should be abandoned. I believe that you should not, you know, you shouldn't really have to depend on something like that in your, in your, in your province or in your city and as a citizen, you shouldn't need it. And as a developer, you shouldn't need it. I will tell you, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that appeals can double the time or triple the time uh, for anything to happen, good or bad. And we know that all is about money. It's all about what you deliver to the consumer and all of those things. So there has to be a strong culture of collaboration that you build in a community. And you have to start it at the individual level, but I think it's the municipality that does, has to do that. That's my honest view. Thank you. Okay. Let me see. One more here. Thank you. Um, the issues of densification and intensification, uh, how you interpret it uh, according to the fabric. I understand that in Vancouver, there were battles for a while. Um, some decades, ag a couple of decades ago, about <coughs> the um, size of the footprint, for example, yeah. uh, that would obstruct other people, the two towers that began. Yeah. I would say that the central uh, fabric of Vancouver now is based on uh, towers uh, with a small footprint. Yes. 
uh, which, okay, I guess the former um, fabric uh, has more or less gone. It's very interesting in parts of Toronto. Um, if you look out, if you go to the top of the uh, AGO in Toronto and look out the window to the west, it's a small, low-scale fabric. Uh, if you are further to the east, it has grown uh, far more in terms of towers. Um, how, in terms of uh, where a city is going, especially the central areas perhaps, uh, can you um, make sure that the fabric is understood, respected? Intensification can mean different scales uh, as long as they don't, if, if the area that they're in is uh, continuous enough to be understood as a fabric, that they don't destroy it. And um, uh, one does see middle height, for example, or lower height, but very dense places. What do you think? What I uh, found in, in the case of Vancouver, which is the one I know a lot about, uh, is that one of the reasons that we used to have terrible struggles, really incredible battles, was because we had a very few models. They were straight jacketed by law that didn't allow any flexibility. They were not based on any attitude about community or any community opinions or anything. They were based just on some theories of urbanism of the day. They were very theoretical. Or they were based just on some two or three formulas that had been found to be workable by the development of community of the day. And what we first had to do was to have a genuine discussion to learn what people worried about. And then we had to go further and actually do something about it. The way that we got to the small floor plates was that people told us that views were important and that they wanted the density, but they wanted the views and people told us they wanted to get up and, and be able to see things. And we just tested floor plates until we found ones that if you placed it in, you kept most of the views open. We did studies of proximity to determine what distance you had to be away before you could have real privacy. You know, as buildings get too close, you can see everyone changing when they go to bed at night. Well, that's not good. But if you move more than we found in research, very uh, you know, empirical research, that if you went a, more than about 80 feet apart, then people just stopped looking at one another. It, it's just, it was just better. Um, the, then we started adding other factors into the equation, such as the street wall, which was mentioned by Ben at the beginning. The invention of the street wall just calmed a lot of people down about the whole thing because what they were really worried about was how horrible it was to walk along the streets when all there was was what we used to call them pigs in space. There were just these big towers and everything else was weird and vague. And instead now there's a true street experience. There's uh, domesticity. There's, uh, there's things happening. There's people. There's incidents. There's interest. There's detail. Uh, and so that helped to change uh, people's minds. People said to us, even with everything that we're, you're doing, we still are not in favor of what you're up to because you're just denying the views of the, from important public places to important things that we want to see, like the lions in the mountains and other things like that. So we did a very detailed study of those views and we protected those views. And then we, on the other side of the equation, we gave a bonus or an incentive to a developer if he found himself within one of those view corridors. So he would not have any economic, negative economic impact of that public policy. So what you, I was trying to say is that you slowly, we, we slowly built up a different form than what we theoretically started with, which was manifest from the debate and discussion among our community people to a point that when we tested it with them, they said, yeah, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm, yeah, I'm, yes, I'm okay with that as a, as a more standard thing. Now we live in a democracy and 20% of people against you is a consensus in my book. Uh, but the fact is that, that 70 or 80% of people in favor of something is a pretty good record. It doesn't just happen theoretically. There is not a model you can import from one place to another. You have to go through the conversation in your town. And when you go through that conversation, you will find there are answers. And as long as people see as real, you know, human beings uh, participating in the body politic, as long as they see that there's been a good debate and things have been taken care of and people get more comfortable. 
They're just more willing to go along with different things. But if they just see the same old thing, I've heard of a case here, for example, where a very dumb building would, had to, would have had to have been built to stay within the envelope in a straitjacket zoning. So instead, the developer went through all kinds of machinations, uh, the developer knows who I'm talking about, uh, all kinds of machinations to make it better for his neighbors. Not for himself, well, maybe for his project, but for his neighbors. Well, you shouldn't put a developer through that. You should make it easy for the developer to do that. And so the, that dialogue between people and a development is one thing, but pulling back from that, you know, the worst place to make policy is the moment when you're trying to make a decision. When money's at stake, you know, all the, our blood is running high and all that. You've pulled back and you have those discussions uh, when you're all dreaming about your town. And then you put the guidelines in place and then you apply them. And then, you know, you double check. And that's how I think you, you, you achieve building forms. The last thing I'll say about this is we are coming out of a period where we have not actually been doing urban design in most of our cities for probably 60 years. So we don't have the models, we don't have the standard things that we find works most of the time. They, they got lost and we have to reinvent them now. That's why, that's why I wanna re-empower the architectural community. I wanna re-empower the landscape architects because they are the people that have been trained to do these studies and to come up with real answers. But we don't allow them to do it. We don't allow them. If you put a system in place that favors design, you will empower your architects. Let me tell you what I know. I'm a developer. That's one of the things I do for two days a month, but uh, I'm a developer. If I'm working in a town that, that really looks at design and has a design panel and urban design guidelines and everyone's paying attention, the architect is the most powerful person on my team. If I'm going to a town where there's no one interested in design, now I'm, I'm building for effect here because I usually worry about it, but uh, my, my development company, if we're going to a town where no one's worried about the design, the architect is the least important person on our team. The, the marketing guy is more important, the finance guy is more important, the technical guy that gets the streets done more important, right? So you have to create a system that empowers your architects and your landscape architects. And when you do, they will invent solutions that work for your community if you allow them to talk to your community. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Oh, uh, just a quick question. Uh, the project you're working on in Abu Dhabi right now with a carbon neutral city, uh, what lessons can any Canadian city learn from that project, if any? And if we could learn any lesson, how can we implement it here with the limited resources that we have in Canada? And I'm here. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll give you very quickly a positive lesson and a negative lesson. The positive lesson is to have the audacity to do it. To have government endorse and put money into making a model because I believe it will change everything that comes after it. So that's the positive message. The negative message is that they're not actually doing it right. They actually are, haven't looked at the genuine balance between workplaces and housing to ensure they have a maximum amount of people living and working in the place. So they still have those parking garages all around the outside. That's not good. I don't normally say that in public in Abu Dhabi because I don't want to do anything to tarnish the government's interest in doing this carbon and waste neutral community. But when we did our urban design assessment in the urban design panel I convened there, well, that was exactly what we said. You've got to do it right when you do it and it's got to actually perform as in a carbon neutral way. If everyone drives to the site and then works on the site and drives home, the other side of Abu Dhabi, it's not gonna be carbon neutral, even though on the site itself, there may be no carbon uh, in use. So those are the two, I could tell you 50 other things, but those are at least two things that might be relevant and interesting. Thank you all very much. Thank you. We were ex extremely fortunate, uh, not only to have uh, Larry here, but to actually have two lectures from him. Uh, to see how he performs in an oratorial uh, mode and to see how he thinks on his feet. And I frankly, I'm extremely impressed with both modes. So thank you very much, Larry. This was fantastic.